Hello and welcome to my channel. Um, it's been a while since I've come up with another story. Um, this is, as ever, a short story which is based on five random words assigned by a random word generator. And the words for today's story are... And this story is called... Paragon of Pulchritude. So Google that if, if uh, you're not familiar with those words. Anyway, here we go. When the great Gandolfi stooped to present a handkerchief he'd supposedly produced from inside a raw egg, Susanna was tempted to boot him into the crowd. His plentiful rump certainly was a tempting target, and the uncomfortable heeled booties he made her wear, despite her protestations that they cut her heels and toes to ribbons, would certainly launch him successfully into the front row. The only thing that stopped Susanna from ending her career in that moment was the realisation that she might hurt some of the young women who stretched up to beg the bigoted fraud's favour. It wasn't their fault Gandolfi had a reputation as a fiery Latin lover, when in reality he was an Irish bruiser from Spokane. The newspapers and playbills all portrayed him in glowing phrases like remarkable magician and flamboyant conjurer when Susanna knew him to be a small-town fraudster who bought his act wholesale from an ailing blind prestidigitator who could no longer tour and who sold him a warehouse of equipment and a few handwritten books of tricks for $50. Susanna had encountered Paddy Byrne when he was developing his act on the lower reaches of the vaudeville circuit. She'd been a 17-year-old throwing cartwheels in a park in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and he'd admired her from the shade of a nearby oak and introduced himself with typical grandiloquence. My dear, you have a rare grace and elegance. Have you ever considered a career on the stage? Of course, Susanna had been flattered. Life didn't promise her much more than working in her father's grocery store when she left school at the start of that summer. She dreaded telling her father she was leaving, but Byrne had come cap in hand to beg her father's leave to release his daughter to the magician's care. Susanna had been slicing ham behind the counter while her father and Byrne chatted outside the store, and she noticed how obsequious her would-be boss seemed. This surprised her since her father had the darkest skin of any shopkeeper on the street, and Byrne seemed to be treating him as an equal. It was this reversal of the norm that impressed her more than anything. When her father came back into the store, he shook his head fondly, looked at his expectantly awaiting daughter and said, Go on then, Susie, I'll finish up the ham. Susanna had raced out into the street to shake Byrne's hand and start her new life in showbiz. Of course, it was too good to be true. When Susanna turned up at the warehouse two days later, expecting to start learning the art of conjuring, Byrne had grabbed her shoulders, pushed her back out into the sunlight and appraised her like a piece of meat. God damn it, you're so pale-skinned. I'd never have took you for a mulatto. It wasn't the welcome she was hoping for. Her boss's attitude to her seemed to fluctuate daily mostly dependent on whether he'd had a skinful or not. That said, Byrne did teach her the ropes with a minimum of verbal abuse and sent her to a local seamstress to be fitted with a fancy costume, all sequins and feathers. Just 14 nights later, they pulled up in Kirksville, Missouri on the afternoon train to prepare for their first show. Boy, here's a quarter. Go get a trolley for our boxes, said Byrne to a Negro lad who jumped up from talking to his friends at a shoeshine stand. Soon a teetering circus of boxes and trolleys was wobbling its way towards the opera theatre, five shoeshine boys in tow. For the next six months, the great Gandolfi and his paragon of pulchritude would perform twice nightly 15-minute vaudeville sets, featuring a dozen tricks ranging from the mundane, doves from flattened top hats interlinked metal rings, to more elaborate, Susanna disappearing into a large cloth bag and reappearing from the wings. The high point of the set was the zigzag girl routine. Susanna would step gracefully into a tall box painted with oriental dragons. The box had gaps for her left toe and right hand to protrude, concealed behind little doors. Rectangular blades would be inserted into slits in the box's sides, and then Gandolfi would slide the, the centre section fully sideways, seemingly slicing Susanna into three sections. Of course, it was all a cunning illusion, a mixture of the magician substituting solid blades for flexible ones, as well as the design of the box itself. The trick used a combination of optical illusion and a 45 degree mirror flipping out at just the right moment 
to give Susanna a space to slide her torso into, whilst reflecting a red curtain to the right of the stage, as if it were the red backdrop. It was a clever variation on a common trick, and generally wowed audiences by the odd drunk who would heckle until the management intervened. Tonight, the 43rd night of the tour, they had reached New Orleans, and Susanna was entranced by the French Quarter with its voodoo vibe and lively nightlife, with jazz seemingly spilling from every other doorway. She felt immediately at home, even though her skin tone was so light she was often mistaken for a Mexican or even a white lady. Byrne was in a foul mood. Some of his fees had been reduced when audiences booed the more familiar tricks in his repertoire, and the reviews had been mixed up best. To be honest, he was a lousy conjurer, often dropping cards or fumbling his tricks. Furthermore, a vindictive theatre owner who turned out to be a grand wizard with a local clan took one look at Susanna and cancelled their appearance, then called the other seven theatres he owned and kiboshed those shows too. That's what I get for hiring a negress, Byrne grumbled, drunk on whiskey and smoking one of his customary foul-smelling cigars as he roughly adjusted the blonde wig he'd brought Susanna to further disguise her mixed origins. Things came to a head at the second French Quarter's show. It was a segregated theatre, so they were playing one show for the white folks and a second for the blacks. During prep for the first show, a black stagehand took a shine to Susanna and politely asked if she'd like to step out with him to a jazz club after the show. Although Susanna only offered a shrug in response, Susanna thought that she perhaps would let Anthony show her the sights later on. As she finished helping Gandolfi with the golden rings, Susanna heard a scuffle from the back of the theatre. The house lights flickered on briefly, and she saw Anthony being frog-marched out of a sea of disapproving white faces. He'd been watching from the back of the stalls, a big no-no in this segregated auditorium. Gandolfi continued his routine as if nothing had happened. But as he shut Susanna inside the box, her employer leaned in with his whiskey breath and murmured, Looks like your boyfriend's been canned. Then Gandolfi closed the upper door and Susanna was alone in the musty, muffled darkness. She turned her head and noticed the drunkard had left a half-empty quarter bottle of liquor on the hidden shelf in the box where the mirror was concealed. What a joker. Susanna decided this would be her last show for the Irish drunk. He hadn't even appreciated her clever innovation, a diagonally striped dress that emphasised her curves and made her look subtly bigger, reinforcing the impact of the illusion. He'd said it made her look fat. As she stewed in the hollowness that was both her life and the immediate environment, Susanna heard the fake blade slide roughly into the slots by her left hip and shoulder. Then there was a hollow rumble of laughter, one of Gandolfi's jokes had uncharacteristically hit home. The temperature in the box grew hotter and the heavy wig made Susanna's scalp itch. The old buffoon was milking the crowd. She should have been emerging triumphantly into wild applause by now, but he hadn't even knocked on the box to signal that in five seconds he'd be yanking her midsection to the left. Susanna suddenly felt a brutal yank of the middle part of the box, then laughter. Gandolfi was pretending the box had stuck. This wasn't in the routine and it hurt. Susanna quickly twisted it into position and pushed out the mirror so that she could edge onto a sitting position on the shelf. There, the midsection of the box shuddered out and there was an audible gasp. Susanna just managed to get her foot and hand into the relevant spots to wiggle at the audience when Gandolfi opened the relevant flaps. It's not real! Her foot's not real! The wiseacre's heckle received a volley of support and then Gandolfi did something that pushed Susanna's idle thoughts of rebellion into full focus. He trod on her toe. She yelped and the audience roared with laughter. Gandolfi opened the door in front of her face and Susanna scowled into the hot stage lights, inspiring another volley of laughter. Gandolfi was sucking on one of his big fat cigars, clearly in no hurry to slide the box back into its vertical alignment so she could relax from her contorted pose. Good night, sweetie, Gandolfi cooed drunkenly, blowing smoke in Susanna's face as he shut the door. She began to feel fury swell within her, a hot liquid fury that wanted vengeance. Susanna turned to the whiskey bottle and thought of the act preceding hers and the lessons she'd learned that morning, just for fun, from Fernando the Fire Eater. When Gandolfi finally let Susanna out of the box, she was in considerable pain and the magician presumably thought her puffed out cheeks were symptomatic of discomfort. Susanna blasted a mouthful of liquor into the charlatan's face. 
His glowing cigar tip lit the cloud of grain alcohol, and Gandolfi's powdered periwig caught fire, sending him rushing to the side of the stage to dip his head into a sand bucket filled with chewing tobacco, sand, and the stubs of a thousand cigarettes. Gasps and laughter ensued as Susanna raced backstage and fled by the tradesman's entrance into the lurid night of a New Orleans evening. Antony, remarkably, was sitting on the stoop, holding a trumpet in one hand and a rose in the other. Taking his arm, Susanna threw away her wig and dashed barefoot out into the balmy summer night. There you go. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And if you did, um, please share it. Uh, share the video, um, share the link, and subscribe if you haven't. And maybe like or comment. Do any of those things to show that someone's watching because Frankly, I don't know if anyone is, but <laughs> for anyone who's made it this far, I appreciate your interest and I'll see you again soon. Bye bye.